really honored by the invitation to give this talk. Jeff, um, uh, Jeff, as many of you know, is a, is a terrific editor of a terrific journal, and the special features have been a real pleasure for my colleagues and I to, to sort of come together and, and debate what we really know about pollination biology. And so today, uh, I really want to challenge all of you to get out of your comfort zone. I hope an hour from now, when you leave this talk, you'll think a little bit differently about, about flowers and how they work and how they've evolved. Um, flowers are visually dazzling. It is self-evident to all of us. It has been for thousands of years. Um, and, you know, the, the, there are burial sites in prehistory that have flowers in them. Uh, the flowers have many meanings and, and to, to many different cultures, and, and many people in our society have written excellent books about this. Um, Maybe not that dark, please. Um, <laughs> and of course, flower color and pattern is extremely important. And I want to urge all of you to go to Stacy Smith's talk. She's doing really excellent, exciting work on color. And uh, I want to make it clear that, that what I have to tell you about flower scent is not in any way uh, an opinion, reflective of an opinion that, that color and scent are opposing, opposing forces in pollination biology. What, what we all want in pollination is to understand how flowers work, how they evolve, um, and how all the different modalities that pollinators and enemies respond to in flowers actually come together. Um, what's so compelling about how flowers look is that our brains understand them to some extent. Uh, this beautiful iris from South Africa um, clearly has arrows showing its long tongue fly pollinator where to put the tongue. That's so intuitively satisfying to us. Um, what I want you to think about, though, is the scale at which we experience the, you know, the, the botanical world. Um, for pollinators, for many pollinators, flowers are their world. Flowers are their trysting sites, their mating spots, their hosts. Uh, they spend all their lives in them. They meet their friends in them. They compete in them. Um, and, if, and if you would go to travel with Gulliver, as my children did in Montreal a few years ago, uh, down to the scale of, a, of an insect visiting a flower, you would have a very different perspective experientially and, 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 sens and in a sensory way uh, of what flowers are. Um, if you enter a bouncy house made of, out of vinyl at the scale that a bumblebee enters a, a lady slipper orchid, you would experience texture. You would be surrounded by chemistry, the chemistry of vinyl, okay? And you would find your way out, just as in a lady slipper with a pollen package right on your head. Um, and so I, I, tell, I urge my students and my colleagues to think about flowers at the scale that animals experience them. Um, because if you've got your head in a flower as a bumblebee, you are experiencing a lot of chemistry, volatile chemistry and non-volatile chemistry. So where I want to go today is to give you a kind of broad stroke journey through uh, what we think we've learned and our learning about floral scent and how it structures plant pollinator interactions. Um, first, I'm going to talk about uh, large scale community interactions and pollinator networks, where I think chemistry might be important and what kind of evidence we have that it is. Um, direct and indirect selection, phenotypic selection on scent as a component of complex floral phenotypes, usually measuring seed fitness. Um, geographic variation in uh, chemically mediated interactions between plants and pollinators, which is really this engine of evolution, I think. Um, and then reproductive isolation, looking at a number of case studies. Everybody knows, if they know anything about scent at all in flowers, it's about the outliers. It's about the strange gothic horror stories of mimicry and deception, the titan harems, the, the dead, the dead, well, the plants that, that, that mimic carrion and, 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 and uh, feces and things. And, I, and beautifully documented work by people like Florian Schiestel and um, Manfred Ayasa and, and Rod Peacol on sexual deception in orchids. I won't touch on that today. We don't have enough time. But that's what everybody does know about scent. What I'm going to try to do today is focus on well-known model systems in conventional nectar-driven plant pollinator interactions where people tend not to think that chemistry matters. They tend to, to focus more on things like density of display and color um, and, and kind of classic optimal foraging approaches to governing how animals find flowers. Okay, I got into this business by studying night-blooming flowers with very strong fragrances. Um, and uh, what I have shown, what I'm showing you here is, is two guilds of, of gardenia or jasmine-like plants that bloom at night and are, have very long nectar tubes and are pollinated by hawk moths, same latitude 
in uh -huh. uh, South Africa and in Argentina. And so in many places around the world, you can find these kind of, of guilds of plants that share pollinators and often do so through a shared template of chemistry. This has been known for a long time by perfumers because these plants are a source of many of the world's greatest perfumes. They just by through the artifact of humans finding them attractive and not nauseating. Um, but these compounds, linalol, uh, indole, uh, benzyl alcohol, and benzyl acetate, neurolidol, these are almost ubiquitous in night blooming plants around the world. So there's a template, there's a pattern. It's hard as visually oriented biologists to find pattern in scent. We've worked very hard uh, with analytical chemistry and with statistics to find those patterns. What I want to show you now is what we parse from the pattern. So take one of these plants, Nicotiana longiflora from Argentina, and look at its scent. And what it's got is representative of all the plant physiology, okay? There's pollinator attractants here. These are aromatic aldehydes and esters. Um, they're plant defense compounds. These green leafy volatiles uh, are emitted by trichomes on the plant. They are all about defending it from enemies. Um, there's phylogenetic signal. There are compounds in here that are, that are um, indicative of that clade of Brazilian tobaccos and our shared derived characters for that clade. And there's biosynthetic, you know, I don't like the word noise, but, but certainly biosynthetic signal. Um, because to make single compounds of these groups, you often have to make related compounds. There's a lot of pleiotropy in scent biosynthesis. So these are patterns that come out of analyzing, you know, gas chromatographic um, data for any of these flowers. The other thing is, they're not static. This, this plant emits odor over three or four days on a nocturnal rhythm. Okay, so there's a lot of dimensions to studying floral scent. It's not easy, uh, but it is worthwhile. I hope to convince you of that today. Um, and there's, of course, phenotypic plasticity. And, and one of the great areas of growth in this field is the removal of silos between plant defense and plant reproductive biology. There's an awful lot of, of phenotypic plasticity that results when a plant is being attacked in how it advertises, how it reallocates energy to reproduction and how that's reflective in the volatiles that those flowers emit. Okay, coming back to my title for a moment. Um, I wasn't trying to be glib. I had been asked a couple of years ago to write a commentary in science about this just gorgeous work by Danny Kessler, Gates, and Ian Baldwin, um, where they used gene silencing to die, beautifully dissect one tobacco, wild tobacco species from the Mojave Desert, Nicotiana attenuata, um, by selectively ablating benzyl acetone or nicotine. And it's up that the, that the plants don't just defend themselves with nicotine, uh, they put nicotine in their nectar. And that's really strange um, for a flower to, to, to spike its nectar with a toxin. Um, and what they found, beautiful set of analyses uh, with paternity, with microsatellites, was that um, hummingbirds and hawk moths uh, don't like nicotine, but they tolerate it. Uh, but what it does is it changes their movement patterns so that they visit fewer flowers on the same plant and they move uh, pollen, they increase outcrossing rates. Um, but by silencing nicotine, what, they, what the authors learned is that you get a lot more nectar robbing by uh, carpenter bees and a lot more florivory by um, tobacco budworm caterpillars if those flowers don't have nicotine in their nectar. And so there's this beautiful balance between attraction and defense and subtle manipulation of, of pollen flow and gene flow in this mixed mating plant that I, uh, I use the metaphor of an invisible hand uh, to describe. But the more I read about this, the more I thought about my own research, it seemed that there were more than one hand. Um, so I actually want to use the, the metaphor of the dancing Shiva and mention <coughs> mudras as manifestations of multifunctional plant products. And so attraction is something we think of as common for floral scent, but so is repellence. And more and more data indicate that a lot of animals don't like floral volatiles. Um, deception is a major theme. Floral scent is, is one of the primary means by which uh, flowering plants uh, dupe pollinators to think that uh, it's a mate or, or a brood site or even a source of nectar. And also learning, something I won't really talk very much about today. There's a large and growing literature on how different classes of, of flower visiting animals learn and to associate combinations of color, shape, and scent 
with a good meal, or conversely, with an aversive experience. Okay, so classic conditioning, Pavlovian you know, psychology. So I want to talk a lot about these different roles today. Um, so let's talk about the structure of plant pollinator networks for a moment. This is a tr explosive growth field at present. And so people, more and more in poll poll pollination biology, people are seeing these kind of bipartite graphs where you have pollinator species one through N on the left, flowering plant species in a given community, you know, A through Z on the right. And the links um, indicate, we hope, in most cases, uh, strong uh, relationships of, of not only visitation, but pollination and pollinator services. And we've heard several talks at this meeting and other meetings about how important the hubs are. Flowers that feed the whole community of insects and, 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 and insects that, or pollinators that service much of the community. Um, and the strong take home measures from, uh, from these studies are that these hubs uh, subsidize you know, uh, the specialized species of pollinators and plants. That without this kind of network, you couldn't have a really specialized orchid that only uses that bee uh, and, and vice versa. There are some negative consequences of this literature, one of which is that it kind of puts obligate specialization out the door as something, as an afterthought. And of course, all you have to do is, is flip this over into fruit set, and then there's the fig feeding the whole forest you know, with its fruits. So th there, there are some caveats that have to be taken into account. But you know, one of the things that's bothered me about this, this literature is that um, ecologists have fallen in love with the mathematics of, of matrices uh, and food webs. And as a result, um, the models of what brings insects to flowers or animals to flowers have become sort of Brownian motion. And, and as a behaviorist, that's anathema to what I do. I'm, I'm all about sensory biology and, and, and how animals decide to visit flowers. Uh, what's that decision-making process? So here's an example of a hub. Uh, this comes from Theodora Pitani, who's beautiful work in Greece. Uh, Andrina nigrinia is a solitary bee that is a hub. It visits a lot of different kinds of plants. Um, and so in that part of the study, it's kind of a mathematical entity, right? It's just something that collides with, with 20 different species of flowers in, in the Greek Phrygia. But when chemical ecologists study Andrina nigrinia, it's the pollinator of this Ophrys orchid. And, it, and that connection, that link, is all about chemistry. It's all about pheromone mimicry. And the thing that really jumps out of this literature is the conflict in worldview of, you know, if that's a chemical link, why aren't these possibly chemical links? Why would that animal cut, you know, not use its antennae to eat food and only use its antennae to find a mate? So that's kind of a fundamental question in these, in these analyses. And I want to show you um, what happens when you ask, not about the specialist, but the hubs, when you ask them if they respond to chemistry. So here's a project that we did with Robert Juncker and um, Anna LaRue in Germany and Austria. And we took two hubs. We took uh, Achillea, okay, and Cerzium arvensi, two really trashy weeds, invasive plants worldwide, big hubs in a German meadow. Okay, everybody visits them. Um, here's what happens when you don't manipulate them. They have, they have a big network that is not fully overlapping. But when Robert and Anna took pentane extracts of these flowers and swapped them, okay, what they got was a temporary um, breakdown of, um, of structure in the web. Okay, that, that animals that don't visit thistle or don't visit Achillea started doing that. Started getting a lot of flies coming to plants that don't reward them, bumblebees coming to, to yarrow, which they never do. And the beauty of using pentane extracts is that that switch decayed as the pentane and the volatiles involved in it um, all evaporated. And so after 20 minutes, that network resolved itself back into the original. Okay, and we did it at two different sites and we hit it with a lot of statistics. But it's a gorgeous demonstration that this is not being driven by color and visual den and density of display. If it were, the extracts wouldn't have done anything. So it's probably about learning. It's probably about what they've associated with, uh, with rewards. But you can actually test those things. The chemistry of those two plants is very different, even though they're both in the Asteraceae. Okay, Yarrow makes almost all terpenes, monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes. Um, Cerzium arvensi is all about aromatic esters and um, clovey type things. And um, when you do the bioassays, which is something that Robert is great at, is taking an olfactometer out into the field, um, what you get is that 
uh, some of its attraction, so honeybees really like the odor of Cersei Marvensi, and some of its repellents. They really don't like the odor of yarrow. And, okay, so in a Y-tube, you can actually test against air as to what your preferences are. And so both attraction and repellents are responsible for, for some, some structure here. All right, let's move on to, to phenotypic selection analyses. Another growth area, um, it's been a couple of decades since Landy and Arnold uh, pioneered the use of selection gradient analysis, and there have been many studies in the last 10 years applying this to um, seed fitness and floral characters. So one of the first ones to use um, floral scent in the analysis was by Amy Paratnowicz, who was a recent graduate at Cornell. Um, she studied Penstemon digitalis. Again, not an outlier plant. This is a common prairie plant, northeastern plant, pollinated by a guild of bees, many different species of bumblebees and, and smaller invented bees. Uh, it's got a color polymorphism. Um, and what Amy did was a non-targeted, unbiased assay of, of regressing flower size, color, score, daily display, flower number, and total floral scent emissions against seed fitness in a common garden of plants from three different populations around Ithaca. And what she found was that for selection differentials and the selection gradients, um, total display and scent were under strong selection, but color and flower size were not. So this is, a head, again, a head-to-head -head comparison. If you omit the scent data, these might jump up. Okay, because it's about unexplained variance. Um, but there are lots of studies in which that hasn't happened. And so I see this as, I mean, Penstemon digitalis is interesting, but it's also kind of a placeholder for what we don't do. Um, you, what Amy did was followed up on this and said, okay, total scent, that could mean a lot of things. Which scent compounds are, you know, let's regress those and see which ones are under, are the targets of selection. It ended up that, that, that linalol was a compound that came out um, significantly different than uh, than the null model, uh, and the other compounds did not. So then, okay, linalool is a common scent compound in a lot of plants. What does it do? Where is it? How is it working in this plant? Um, we dissected many, many flowers and looked at their chemistry. So the, the corolla, the, you know, the, the, the action part of the flower is scentless, actually scentless. Um, the little nectar tube, the little spur, the base of that penstemon flower, is full of chemistry, okay? Sesqui terpenes, monoterpenes, and there's our linalol. Just a little peek, not very much there. Uh, the trichomes back here are full of uh, fungal odors, okay? So these, if you ramp them up, smell like mushrooms. Um, but they're there the whole time, bud, senesce flower, everything. Those are constitutive, and there must be about defense. And then if you look at the stamens uh, and the pollen, they're full of things that the rest of the flower doesn't have. And the coolest thing is the smallest organ in the, in the, in the whole flower, the, the sterile staminode that all penstemons have, is producing uh, red hot cinnamon. Okay? And, the, and, and the important thing there is that we know from other elegant studies on penstemons that staminodes position bees to, to, to mod moderate the way that they remove pollen and apply pollen when they visit the flower. And it's the first thing that they contact on their way in. And if that smells of red hot cinnamon, um, a bee would certainly perceive that. Okay. And there's our linalol. And the, the beautiful thing about this is that linalol in the nectar spur, and it's a polar compound, means that linalol is a flavor. Okay, it's in the nectar. And we uh, confirm that by actually collecting nectar and collecting scent from it. And so here's the part about shrinking yourself down to the size of a bee. You're in a flower, you're surrounded by the corolla, your tongue is out with chemoreceptors on it, and you're probing in a hole that smells like Earl Grey tea. That's what these guys are doing. And so there's a lot of hypotheses yet to test about how it works. It could be something that they remember as a gustatory cue. It could be a way to keep yeast from growing in the nectar over two days because linalol has antimicrobial properties. It could be a way from keeping thrips from drinking the nectar because they go into those flowers. There's a lot of hypotheses we still have to test. But there's a smoking gun. Okay. Um, that's a great lead in into the, into the question of how do flowers balance defense and offense? And the best system that I grew up as a grad student reading about was uh, Candy Galen's work on Polymonium viscosum. Uh, many of you know this work. It's a classic in pollination biology. There's an altitudinal gradient in the Rocky Mountains where uh, at timberline and below, plants have very strong, skunky smell associated with their trichomes, uh, which is very uh, effective at defending the plants against ants. 
Above Timberline, what you get is a very strong, sweet, hyacinth odor. Um, and Candy has long described these as sort of sweet and skunky, and there's a kind of altitudinal difference in, in them. What we learned using our chemistry analyses was that they all smell sweet. It's just that the trichomes above Timberline don't have these kind of sulfur volatiles, and they're not as skunky. Um, but the cool thing about it is the interplay in this system between chemistry and floral morphology. Um, Candy and her students have worked a long time to study the importance of the flare of the nectar tube in defending these flowers against ants. These formica ants are, are formidable um, nectar thieves and they snip the stigmas uh, so they remove female fitness from the plants. Um, but also the, the, the kind of nectar flare, uh, the tube flare is important for the effectiveness of bumblebees and in applying and removing pollen. Um, and what we found was that uh, the, the strongest sweet odor is 2-phenylethanol. It's also a nectar flavor because it's very polar. It's in the corolla and it solves into the nectar. So it's, it's a gustatory as well as olfactory cue. Um, the narrow flowers tended to have a small amount of this and the broad campanulate flowers tended to produce huge amounts of it. And we did a lot of manipulative experiments over three field seasons and found that um, this compound was strongly repellent both to ants and to bumblebees. But the net outcome was that uh, a flower could have a larger corolla flare if it pumped out a lot of 2-phenylethanol because the ants would stay away from it. The consequences for bees is that they would visit fewer flowers per plant and move on. So this is nicotine and nectar all over again. Okay, and so the plants, these plants are pollen limited and the pollinator mediated selection on corolla shape is much stronger in them than in the narrow ones. So there's an indirect effect of scent on a system that we thought we knew well for 28 years. Um, but without the manipulative experiment, we wouldn't have known that it was acting in concert with, nectar, with, with, with corolla flare. All right, let's move on to geographic variation. Um, people who have studied floral scent have tended not to do it with replication. There, that has tended to be a kind of chemist-oriented typology of you know, almost collecting species. So, so scent, studying scent as a species trait rather than a population level trait. Um, so what we found is that there's variation out there at any scale that you want to look at. Um, a good example of this is a study that was done by Sally Chess and Gretchen Laboon with me a couple years ago on Linanthus dichotomus. It's a California native. It's a, a food deceptive plant, not an orchid. It has no nectaries at all but it smells like jasmine and it's, and it's pollinated by moths. Um, south of San Francisco Bay, it's a night bloomer. Uh, they'll bloom for two weeks, but they close their flowers in the daytime. North of the bay, they open eight hours earlier. Um, this is a common garden experiment. Five populations of, uh, of, of, of each region grown in the same greenhouse in San Francisco. Um, emission rates of scent were not different from each other. They all smelled strongly. But when we look at chemical composition by geography, what we find is that the southern populations are strongly um, characterized by these lilac compounds. These are universal attractants of noctuid moths. Okay? This is what you would trap them with if you wanted to trap them. Um, whereas north of the bay, they added these two generic floral scent compounds that are common in everything, especially at thistles, and those, remember, those are the ones that are open eight hours in the daytime as well. So what they're doing is reproductive assurance here. Like by modifying scent composition and uh, flower opening time, they're opening themselves to, to, to being pollinated by bees and butterflies as well as moths. And north of San Francisco Bay, you have a major climate shift um, and, and the distribution of moths is not as abundant um, in those cooler music places. So uh, I want to talk a little bit now about um, about moths. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of continuum in moth pollination from moths that visit flowers for nectar only to those that then also oviposit on the plants to those that are um, obligate uh, uh, seed predators on the flowers but pollinate them as they do it, um, ending in yucca moths, which, which I talked about yesterday in the mutualism symposium. Um, so here's John Thompson, uh, who's done so much to teach us about how geographic variation works in plant pollinator and enemy interactions. Uh, and this is the system that, that he's really championed with many of his students, uh, Lithophragma in the Saxifrage family. 
And so there's a, a, an obligate pollinator here that oviposits it to the flowers. There's another one here that oviposits it to the stems. Um, so it's a nectar feeder and not a, a butt pollinator. Um, and then there are more general pollinators like andrenid bees and bombylius flies that visit it among many other things that they visit. And so the pros and cons of, of, uh, of, of having these guys as your visitors is you have high seed set with this obligate visitor. Um, and uh, when, they're, when, when bees and flies are around, you get that. But they're not very constant because they're um, constantly aware of the other opportunities, whereas these moths really do have to visit the plant. Um, but there are costs associated with that in, term, in, in fitness. And so uh, in the geographic mosaic theory of coevolution, co John has described hot spots where you have obligate interactions between your, uh, your contestants and there's going to be strong reciprocal uh, fitness effects. Um, and then some cold spots where there might be many other players that, that might dilute uh, or complicate the selective landscape um, uh, in terms of, of, of morphology. And there might be trait mismatches that arise there. So we decided to look at this with Magna Freiburg, who's a wonderful guy uh, from Uppsala, Uppsala, Sweden, who's worked with uh, John and I as a postdoc, and look at three different populations of Lithophragma um, that were bound to um, have different interactions with, uh, with gray moths. What we found was that they smell very different. Okay, so just blur your eyes and look at the color coding. Ironic, I'm using color to, <laughs> to characterize chemistry. Zing, um, but, but, but so be it. Uh, they're, they're quite different chemically. Um, and what uh, Magna wanted to do was to ask gray moths from each of these populations, um, how do you feel about the chemistry of the plants that you grew up on? And so um, doing Y-tube experiments, what he showed was that the moths only responded significant, with significant preference for the flower scent of the population that they were from. Okay, so very strong olfactory phylopatry, if you will. Um, and furthermore, when you gave the females no choice of position assays, put them in a tube with a plant from each of these different populations, they always laid more eggs on the ones um, that, that they were from. Okay, so that strong phylopatry is not just a kind of sensory bias, it translates into fitness. Um, now the beauty of this system is that it's, it's, it's completely outrageous. Okay, if you look at the colors here, okay, these are arguably not many species. Okay, there's a lot of debate as to how many lithofragment species there actually are, how differentiated are they. I can tell you that the chemistry differences here in composition are comparable to a family, okay? Not a genus, a family. So there's something really exciting going on in Lithofragma and Grea uh, across Western North America. And we're just beginning to scratch that system. All right, so I'm gonna finish with, uh, by talking about reproductive isolation. Um, everybody loves columbines. Uh, Vern Grant loved them. Um, classic examples of uh, prezygotic isolation, um, ethological isolation, Beautiful experiments done by Scott Hodges and his students showing that um, the orientation of flowers uh, and their color has a lot to do with um, hawk moth and hummingbird preferences. And so when you resupinate them and, and unresupinate them, you find these beautiful differences in the likelihood of a moth to visit a columbine. Um, and Scott and his students have worked very hard to identify the genes and linkage groups that are responsible for that. Um, mechanical isolation, not about attraction, but about pollen transfer. Um, Again, you don't get any differences in the number of visits when you have a, an infinite length to your nectar spur versus a finite length to them. Uh, but you certainly get different, uh, a better pollen transfer when you've got to press your body further into the flower to get the dregs of nectar at the bottom of a bottomless pit. Um, and I always wondered when I read these papers, as much as I loved them, how much of this is also being you know, mediated by chemistry? I, I work with those moths. They respond very strongly to odor color combinations. Um, so I got the chance to do that with Diane Campbell and a group of pl very well-studied uh, plants, Ipomopsis and the Polymoniaceae, another group that Vern Grant really loved. Um, and here are these two species, tenu uh, uh, Ipomopsis tenuatuba and Ipomopsis aggregata, which are involved in a, a, a transition, a similar transition between hummingbird and hawk moth pollination. Um, what Diane Campbell and her postdoc, George Aldrich, showed elegantly over a decade ago was that there's kind of um, incomplete reproductive isolation based on elevation in western Colorado. That in low elevation you have hummingbird visitation to aggregata, 
pockmarked visitation to tenyo tuba and, and never the twain shall meet. And that in, fl in floral morphospace, there, it's very easy to separate uh, morphology, color, morphometrics, etc. cetera. Uh, there's no hybrid zone here. These plants are reproductively isolated. But further up in elevation, cooler evenings, um, there's some breakdown. Hummingbirds start visiting the white ones and hawk moths start visiting the red ones. And as a result, there are hybrid swarms uh, where you cannot differentiate morphology or color because there's a lot of back crossing and merging and mismatching of traits. And of course, that's an opportunity, right? It's an exciting thing to study. And Diane has invested decades in parsing out the genetic and environmental components of the, that kind of variation. So what we got to do uh, with Masha Bischoff, a, a shared postdoc, was um, try to dissect this system experimentally. Elvia Melendez had shown elegantly in the 90s that by painting flowers, you could ask hummingbirds, you could interview hummingbirds, um, and also by, by modifying the, 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 the width of the, the corolla width of the flowers, you could ask hummingbirds um, what do they prefer and how well do they transfer pollen in a mock hybrid zone, uh, in a flight cage. And so what Masha wanted to do was the same thing for white line sphinx moths. And so what, what she did was, was put together arrays of, of the two Ipomopsis species with or without indole. Indole is an nitrogenous volatile that's common to jasmine and lots of night blooming flowers. And it is the major scent difference between these two species. So by augmenting with indole, we hoped to kind of trait swap without investing 20 years in, 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 in inbred lines and, and gene silencing and so forth. Um, so I'm gonna show you arrays and behavioral responses to the arrays. Here, uh, we have both species, Tenu tuba and aggregata, and, and we haven't painted them. What we've simply done is spike them with indole. And what you see is that adding indole increases the amount of approaches to the red-flowered aggregata, but they still wouldn't probe at it, okay? It wasn't good enough. Um, Tenu tuba already makes indole, so adding more indole to it didn't change anything. They got approached and visited as they do in nature, okay? So this is like a, a positive control. When the arrays were only aggregata, painted white or not, um, adding indole didn't do anything for the white ones and just increased attraction a little bit to the red ones. One of the problems here is that these arrays don't smell very much because you don't have that background of tenua tuba in there. So there's a quantitative effect here of having a scent cloud. And with hawk moths generally, if you have a strong scent cloud, they start poking at anything white, including socks. Okay. This is something that I have demonstrated experimentally. Um, okay. If the array was all tenua tuba, painting them red um, did not deter their attraction, but spiking them with indole helped. Okay, so, but, but look, notice the higher levels of overall attraction to this array than the previous one. And then finally, when everybody is in the pool and everybody gets indole, it's a free-for-all. And this is essentially the hybrid zone. Okay? And one of the coolest inferences for us was that every red-white hybrid zone that we know of, the, the tobaccos in Brazil, uh, the columbines in the Sierras, these ipomopsis, they're all doing this. They're in a scent cloud where, where, where reproductive isolation breaks down because at that point, hummingbirds and hawk moths are just going for everything they've got. And so there's a spatial component of this too that's really, really interesting. Um, the last question before I, I, I wind up here, um, that, that most of the field studies, as elegant as they are, can't really provide us with is, what do those animals know? How experienced are they? What, what have they learned? The good news for us is that uh, we've invested heavily in a laboratory colony of, of the white line sphinx moth. So we could ask that question in the lab. And here's what we found. Um, by giving moths these, and this is their version flight, okay? We, we starved them for four days. Um, or three days, and then we flew them in these flight cages. Um, and what we found was a lot of duds, which is typical, because in nature you don't see the duds, you only see the ones that visit flowers. Um, they almost never visited Ipomopsis aggregata. They just don't like it. It's not attractive to them, it doesn't surpass their threshold. Um, but they do visit Ipomopsis tenua tuba. Okay, it's, it's an innate preference for that species over this, as you would expect from the field. Um, when you spike the red ones with indole and you give them no choice, they eventually will go for it. Which leads to the question, would they ever find it in nature if there was no bright visual display? Um, and the last thing we did was to ask, what happens if you come a second night? 
Okay? So what we're doing here is saying, if you got aggregado the first night, if you get aggregado the second night, what do you do? And the answer was nothing. Okay? They didn't get any better. They didn't get more hungry or desperate. They just boycotted. Um, if they had aggregado the first night, it did not impair their interest in tenua tuba the second night. If they had tenua tuba both nights, they behaved similarly both nights, which was happy visiting. But interestingly, if they had tenua tuba the first night, they were interested in aggregata the second. And so here's a case where we don't quite know yet whether just being rewarded by a flower got them to, to lower their threshold to poke at aggregata, or whether there's some kind of priming effect. Here's something, here's a, here's a, a, a real frontier in, in, in ecological chemistry. We don't know what experiencing scent does to the brains of pollinators. There's some tangential evidence that juvenile hormone gets released, that ovulation happens. There's all kinds of insects that live in flowers that have shifted their reproductive physiology to floral signaling. And so here's a great area for the future to ask, what does experiencing color versus experiencing scent versus experiencing flavors in nectar do to the physiology of flower visiting animals? So let me summarize what I've shown you. Scent can affect seed fitness and structure of floral networks through both attraction and repellence. It can mediate reproductive isolation through attraction, preference, and constancy. And the same compounds, as you've noticed, can play different roles depending on receiver and context. So I want to leave you with this idea that floral scent is a kind of dark matter that's out there explaining a lot of unexplained variance in path analyses and, and networks. And if you don't study it, you won't know. Um, but somehow, our concept structure has to accommodate it and then we'll understand it's not the only thing. It's, of course, there are lots of other aspects of floral biology, but, but floral chemistry, not just the volatile part, is a big part of that, and it has been neglected. Uh, I hope you appreciate that now. So let me end by saying a floral scent has many mudras. It has many manifestations. Um, remember me, if, if, if you went, the animals learn floral scent, and so scent can trigger memories uh, that promote constancy. We talked yesterday about obligate mutualism and secret handshakes. You know, 900 species of figs can't be wrong. Um, and they're all doing their biology through, through special chemistry. Um, probing, okay, so, so when you have nectar that's scented, that could be the olfactory or gustatory version of the white arrow on the purple um, South African iris. Um, none shall pass. If you have plants that, uh, compounds that are repellent, they can f serve as chemical filters, reducing the connectivity. Um, and generalization of flower visiting networks, just as it, as just as it works in fruits. Um, find me in the dark for the, for the system I just showed you. Red flowers on a dark background are, is not good enough for hawk moth at dusk. Um, and so uh, scent helps you navigate upwind and look for bright objects. Um, and then finally, what I lie to you, what I haven't talked about today, are the many, many interesting floral compounds that mediate deception, both sexual deception and brood site deception. So uh, there's more out there to discover that we're just scratching and sniffing the surface. Um, and, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you.